And the barriers might be high, but one company is leading the charge. So joining us to discuss what's next for underwater data centers is Maxie Reynolds. She's the CEO of Subsea Cloud. That company builds underwater, underwater data center pods within 12 weeks, and they can be deployed in our oceans for storage. So Maxie, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, this technology is very new. So start us off with your 60-second quick take about how your technology works. Yeah, okay, thanks for having me. So what's sort of interesting is that it's not actually that new. We have had compute power underwater for give or take 50 years now. You know, the fuel that we get that goes in our cars, that's in our houses, is typically fossil fuel. And so, you know, pipelines, other subsea assets require compute. So our application is fairly new in terms of we're putting you know, megawatts down into the water, but in and of itself, it's it's not really that new. But what we actually do is we we um, build, deploy, and maintain these data centers for for economic and sort of environmental benefits, and it's fairly cost effective in in the way that we are doing it. And uh, Maxi Ness here. So you talk about uh, environmental benefits. Talk to us a little bit about that. What is the biggest problem that Subsea aims to uh, t undertake here? And why should companies be considering underwater data centers? Yeah, okay. So by placing them underwater, you eliminate the electrically driven cooling. And so we see about a 40% reduction in the power that's consumed and so a 40% decrease in the carbon emissions. About, you know, half a every megawatt hour that we consume creates about half a ton of carbon. So when you put a data center underwater, you reduce that carbon by about 900 tons per unit. So it's sort of interesting to look at it that way from a from a climate perspective. Um, right. It's a, and why companies? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, Maxi, to cut you off. I just wanted to say it sounds That's like fine. there's a reduction in carbon usage, but there's also a reduction in cost. Uh, you say that that reduction yes. is about seventy percent, but some of our sources have said that it's kind of a wash because it's expensive to say send someone down to the bottom of the ocean if you need to fix one of these things. <laughs> How do you so, justify yeah. uh, the wash on cost savings? So we're, there are actually um, cost reductions over both the OPEX and the CAPEX. So, so starting with the um, OPEX, there, there are no costs for cooling, right? So that's, that's a big one. And then in terms of maintenance, your maintenance cycle basically is um, elongated. You have to do less to the servers less often because there's no dust, there's no debris, there's no people jostling the cables, things like that. Those are really the biggest factors in determining when a data center goes down or a server goes down within a data center. So we see that. And then we would never send actual people to do this. So we don't rely on divers. We actually use ROVs, uh, remotely operated vehicles, and they're very cost effective. Um, the biggest cost that we face that you obviously do not face on land is the vessel cost. So what we do there, again, to sort of try and be smart economically is to take vessels on what are called interruptible contracts. So they're within a, a sailing radius to a cluster of these units that we place down. And um, what happens is we say, hey, we need you. We have this maintenance window they will stop the job, pause the job that they are on, come to us, and we keep those costs down by by employing that method. Maxi, uh, we talked earlier about Microsoft and its test in 2018, but yeah. are other companies doing this? Are you working with other companies? Give us a little bit of the landscape of where this sits now, and do yeah. you see a, a future where big tech has underwater data centers? I do, so So let's sort of back into this. I absolutely see that as the future. I don't see it as the only method in the future, nor should it be. We should simply move towards immersion cooling, whether that is underwater or not. I think algorithmically, we are probably going to see a bit of an upsurge in data centers underwater because of latency, which is maybe too down in the weeds for this, but ultimately it's required if we're going to use AI at speed and for other things like uh, high frequency trading, things like that. 
So yes, it will happen. Microsoft, um, there, I think you said at the top of this that they were about $25 million for their initial test um, over in Scotland. And there's a few reasons for that. One, it was a test, so there's no economies of scale. But the other thing is that there are two ways to allow something to incur the pressure of water. You can make the walls very thick or you can compensate it from the inside. Microsoft and another company called Highlander, which, I, which are Chinese, um, they make the walls very thick, but there's a sort of skew in this space server coefficient when you do that because you have to make the walls very thick the farther, the deeper you put it into water. Basically for us, we can deploy it 10 feet or 9,000 feet, although 9,000 feet is a little bit of a flex because there's really nothing down there, but we could um, with really little to no technical calculation you know, varying at those depths. So mm. it's sort of interesting how you get things underwater. You you kind of have to be a subsea engineer to really know how to do it effectively. And that's sort of what's missing from, from an analyst's viewpoint.